Times are tough. Days are getting difficult. But there is hope. And we can increase our chance by taking charge of how we respond. With this COVID-19 pandemic, we are facing a crisis. This has disturbed our daily lives, our businesses, and our works. With the development of vaccines and better understanding of the disease, somehow we see brighter days ahead. So yes, there is hope. And we can hasten how we can recover and cope so that we may be able to lead in this time of crisis. The call is to clear the cores that has been clouded. We can do this by taking command of our response. We can do this by embracing leadership regardless of your position or role. So, so that we'll be able to respond, let's take a step back and review what a crisis is. Let's start with its definition. One, the turning point for better or worse. That's a crisis. Another definition. It's an emotionally significant or radical change of status. Third, a decisive moment. Fourth, an unstable or crucial time or state of affairs in which a decisive change is impending, especially one with the distinct possibility of a highly undesirable outcome. Now, from these definitions, we can say that we really need to make a crucial decision in response to a challenging situation we are in. Otherwise, things will get worse. So responsiveness, responsibility, and leadership come into crucial play. Now, to better gear up our understanding, here are four things that a crisis does. Number one, crisis reveals our strengths and weaknesses. If we are not aware of what we can do and cannot do, this will be exposed during crisis. If we are not aware of where we excel at and where we are not so good at, Crisis will reveal this to us. So we must pay attention. For me personally, one of my strengths is being able to adapt with changes in technology and acquaint myself with online tools. One of my weaknesses, however, is the absence of an autopilot system that that can run even without my personal intervention every step of the way. Now in times, in these times, we are forced to shift our business online. And these kinds of strengths and weaknesses are revealed. So my question is, are you paying attention? Number two, crisis shows what we must stop doing, what we must start doing, and continue doing. On a yearly basis, at least, we must do a review, an evaluation on a personal and organizational level. And we need to ask three important questions. That is, what should we stop doing? What should we start doing? And what should we continue doing? If you're not doing this, right, evaluation or review on a personal and organizational basis or level, 
Crisis will force us to answer these and we must respond accordingly. Now, during this pandemic, it was shown to us that we must stop our sole reliance on traditional setups of businesses. For example, brick and mortar stores, while they are generally good to have with the community quarantine in place, customers are not going to stores anymore. At least not as much. Good thing travel restrictions are now easing up. But still, we must start to explore and use several other means to reach our customers. These days, online shopping and the use of websites and apps have taken traction. But take note that these are not new. Hindi bago. We were simply forced to catch up somehow. Now, even the government had to catch up and see how business permits, for instance, could be transacted online. Now, along with these, we see the importance of continuing to take advantage of social media. For example, Facebook and LinkedIn to help in marketing our goods and services. We see that these platforms can even help us sell our products and even do customer care. So the questions now are, what should you stop doing? What should you start doing? And what should you continue doing? Number three, crisis magnifies our status. This pandemic magnified who are poor and who are rich. The difference between those who can afford and cannot afford is amplified, sadly. The sad tendency here is to blame the, the system and even salt on our sad situation. But that's going to lead us to a downward spiral. So let us not do that. We should respond otherwise. We see this reality and then we must take responsibility. Please note that this reality should even push us to persevere in doing what we can to improve our lives, to improve our businesses, to become better at work, and to help others. So what's your status now that you can see more clearly? And from that, what is your response to the situation? Number four that crisis does to us, crisis exposes our core. Take, for example, an orange. When you squeeze an orange, you get an orange. When you squeeze a lemon, you get a lemon. You, don't, you do not get an apple. You do not get a watermelon, right? Now, when you are squeezed or challenged, your core is exposed. Yes, your character, your beliefs, your attitude, your values are shown. If you do not like what is being exposed, then it's time to make a change. Again, this is on a personal and organizational level. If you don't see what you're seeing now in your organization, it's time to make a change. But if you like what is being exposed, then that means you're doing a good job. Persevere, keep it up. And push even more, even how difficult things may be in the days to come. So note that 
if we stick to our core, to our values, and I say good values, right? We believe that we will win in the long term. We'll win in the long term. So the question now is, do you know your values? And from that, or to, to help you do that, review what you are prioritizing and examine how you are responding to this crisis. So again, the four things that crisis does, crisis reveals our strengths and weaknesses. Crisis shows what we must stop doing, start doing, and continue doing. Crisis magnifies our status, and crisis exposes our core. The next question is, how do we cope? And not just cope, but take command amidst crisis. So the, the response here is to review the basics. Let me say that again. Review the basics. Let's take a look at the delivery of goods and services. The delivery of products to customer and clients by several providers in the form of companies and cooperatives. They are the, the providers, right? Now, what we see externally is that money is transferred from the people to the provider in exchange of what? The products availed. Now, the provider demands for a price because the product cost him money and that he must earn profit as well. Paying the price is okay for the people because directly or indirectly, the product he is availing will also help him earn profit. How or where? In whatever that he does in work or in his business. Now, if we dig deeper, this is not just an exchange of product and pesos. There is the creation of value. Value is generated by the provider, paid for by the people, and when they use it, that value is multiplied in different ways. Now, let's take a basic example. Rice. Rice. Rice is something of value. You need it for your energy, for your meal, something to eat, right? So you, as the customer, will pay for it, then bring it home, cook it so you can have something to eat and maintain the energy until the next meal, right? Now, this energy that you have that you paid for, right? When you, you when you bought the rice, okay? This energy that you have will help you perform your work. Hence, generating value to be also used by other people. You see that? So it's it's va generating value and multiplying value in, in different ways. Apply this process to any other goods and service and you will appreciate better the flow of value. Now back to our framework. To deliver the products, the provider has to use processes and programs. And in my processes, they would include the flow of steps and procedures to produce the, the product, to market it, to sell, to account, to do accounting, and even to do customer care processes. Now, the programs would include systems that are put in place to hasten the process, to perform the process in a more efficient, in even faster way. So those are the processes and programs. Now, digging deeper, okay, it's not, it's not just from that. We, we dig deeper and we will find out that behind all these elements that interplay are people. 
people working for or with the providers. These include the staff, the supervisors, the managers, the directors, the leaders. Now, more importantly, we must understand that all of these started with a purpose. And that purpose could either be to solve a problem, a certain problem, or to raise a certain status to a higher level, to, to something better. Now, that purpose is the motivation of the people who started the company or the cooperative. They are, they are known as founders. And with that purpose, they set up the organization to be able to provide value to people through products with the help of their own people, also known as employees. So I hope that framework helped you to go back to the basics and understand that our companies or cooperatives operate this way. Yes. Now, when the basics are clear, we do not just see the exchange of products and services. What we see is the creation and multiplication of value. We do not just see the processes and programs, but more so, we see the people and the purpose. Now, let's take this framework into account Look at the four things that crisis does, which we mentioned earlier, and generate practical insights that we must consider as we face this crisis. So insight number one, agility must be part of who we are. Agility is not a new idea. It's been here even before, but these days, it shouldn't just be an idea. It must be part of who we are and what we do as individuals and as organizations, as cooperatives. Before I learned that this concept is being embraced by high-performing organizations, I actually first heard of this term in Physical Education 1, in college. And yes, it is not just applicable in physical education. It is also very much applicable in life, in business, in cooperatives, and in many areas of our life. So what is agility? Agility means being able to respond or to pivot or change direction quickly without losing balance and momentum, okay? Being able to respond without losing balance and momentum. And you remember the keyword, it's a little bit of in a quick way, but still having that balance. Now take that physical education definition and apply it to life or business. It is being able to respond to the demands of this crisis, to the change of the times while maintaining ongoing business operations. So the question is, are we agile enough as a person and as a group, as an organization, as a cooperative? Number two, we must embrace technology and use them for the good. Technology continues to introduce new tools that we can use. The question is, are we using them? Do we take the time to learn and acquaint ourselves with these developments? 
Or do we dismiss them as bad or simply difficult to learn? Let us remember that these are tools. And using tools entail skill development, meaning it can be learned. It can be developed because it's a skill. So you can develop that. Now, also, these are tools. These are not necessarily good or bad. A tool will be good or bad depending on how we use it. So do we use it for the good or do we use it for the bad? The call, of course, is let's use technology for the good. For the good. Number three, we must develop our communication and leadership skills. They remain as essentials. In fact, their importance is magnified. Mass gatherings now may have been canceled, but public speaking, interpersonal skills, leadership skills are not canceled. In fact, they are much needed even more. The rise of work from home setups and distance learning in the academe, remote access for work or business, these, the rise of these calls for more advanced in communication, advanced communication, and leadership skills. For team management, you no longer see your team members in their desk. They are at home. So how can you tell if they are working or not? We do online meetings. We often do not see nonverbal responses if their videos are off. But, but even with videos, we just often see the, the face, at least that could help, but you don't see the entire thing, the entire nonverbal response. In online meetings, we may not be able to, to hear verbal response, like when they are on mute. How can you tell if you're able to convey the message clearly? How will you know? if the message is received as intended. And I'm praying right now that this message is being conveyed to you well. So if, if you're receiving this, please, please give a, um, please type in the comment section that yes, I'm getting it. So we must then continue to develop our communication leadership skills to advance in these challenging setups. So again, the three practical insights, agility must be part of who we are. We must embrace new technology and use them for the good. And we must develop our communication leadership skills because they remain as essentials. In fact, their importance is magnified. But as we proceed, let us be guided by these four principles. Four principles. Principle one, let us fix our eyes on the mission and be flexible with our methods. Let us not mistake the mission from the method. You must commit to your mission, but you can change your methods if your methods are no longer working because of new circumstances, right? Consider this example. Your aim, for example, is to climb the mountain and go back. Okay, that's the aim. That's the mission. Now your method, okay, your chosen route is to traverse from east, from the east to the west, meaning climb up from the east then go down to the west. That was your plan. That was your chosen path. That's your method. But what if the east route was destroyed? So that method, the first option, will not work now. So you must consider other options. 
So maybe climb up from the west and then go down back again to the west where you started. So you change method, you change the path, the route, but still you're able to climb up the mountain and then come back. You fulfilled your mission, right? So my question is, do you need to change your methods as you stay committed to your mission? That's the first principle. Principle two, establish the relationship first, then the rules. We go back to the framework earlier, emphasizing the foundational role of purpose and people. The mission, okay, the purpose is covered in principle one. In principle two, here comes now the people in the relationship part. We must establish the relationship first before we even start talking about rules. We, when trust is there because the relationship is built, is established, okay, so trust is there, we can expect that the rules will be followed. But where trust is absent, rules might be followed only when the officers are present. Much worse, rules would be ignored. So the question is, do we trust our people? And do our people trust us? Principle number three, develop teams and tools, but teams must come first. Tools are terrific. Yes, we must develop them. Yes, but develop your people first. The systems you have will be useless if the users are not equipped. And, and their technical skills will be dangerous if their character and values are not honed or aligned to yours or to the founder's mission. Here's the thing. I worked in the process improvement for, for some time. And here's what I realized. Process improvement is useless without people improvement. So you must do both. And if you have to choose, prioritize which comes, which must come, come first, develop teams first, okay? People improvement, and then process improvement, right? Principle number four, profits matter, but the people matter more. Let us not sacrifice people for the sake of profits, period. The wise billionaire businessman Richard Branson said, take care of your employees and they will take care of your business. Take care of your people and they will take care of your business. The profits will take care of itself. Now, let me close. Let me close with some practical reminders. Reminder one, check on delivered output more than clocked time. Yeah. Even if you have monitoring or tracking systems, it is better to focus on delivered output rather than simply time-ins and time-outs. Of course, we, we need to check those as they are uh, part of indicators. They're even needed for the computation of payroll, for example. But it's better to have an output-based review or evaluation rather than time-based. Unless, of course, 
time is the better measure. Reminder two, do regular check-in video calls. Okay. Check-in meetings, video calls. We need to maintain the connection and the trust. People are social beings, right? So let's, let us regularly check in with them. If possible, use video so they can, you can see their faces, their responses. And listen beyond what is spoken. Listen beyond what is verbalized. Reminder three, don't just talk about business. Talk about personal concerns too. With due respect to privacy, of course. Now, you don't often hear this reminder, this advice, right? We say that business is business. Let's just, just talk about business. But no, you can never isolate, especially if you're being challenged. You can never isolate a personal concern from the business concern. Of course, as a professional, we must deliver despite challenges. We must, but as a leader, you must take note of those. Because people are people. Now, let me share this simple example. There was a director who was purely business. He would message his staff only when he needs something. One day during this pandemic, he was asking about a certain information from the staff. Okay? The staff responded, of course. But the director didn't even respond or said, thank you. He did not even ask how the staff is doing. The next day, he asked another question. The staff responded. But again, the, direct, the director did not even respond, did not even, said, did not even say thank you or anything. Ganun ba siya busy? Was he that busy that he simply needed an answer and didn't even bother to say thank you? Or even ask how the staff is doing. Or even just a simple acknowledgement of the message. Like, like, got it. Or, okay. What do you think did the staff feel? What do you think will the staff do moving forward? What will you do? if you were the staff in that situation. Or a better question is, what, what will you do? What would you do if you were the director in that situation? Again, take note of those of these three practical reminders, reminder one, check on the delivered output more than the clock time. Reminder two, do regular check-in video calls. Reminder three, don't just talk about business. Talk about personal concerns too. With due respect to privacy, of course. Always keep in mind the four principles. Principle one, fix your eyes on the mission and be flexible with your methods. Principle two, establish relationship first and then the rules. Principle three, develop teams and tools, but teams must come first. And principle number four, profits matter, but people matter more. So friends, let's clear the clouded course. Let's face this crisis with faith. We remember 
Jesus, because he faced death with faith, and then he rose again. He has overcome. We know Martin Luther King, because he did not back down from the fight. He fought peacefully with his leadership and communication skills. A baby is born because the baby and the mother did not give up even how painful and difficult it is. That is similar to facing crisis with faith. So now, therefore, let us take command of our responses. Let us learn to lead in times of crisis. And may, may the principle and tips we reviewed today help us clear the clouded cores we are treading today. Let us respond accordingly, take responsibility, embrace leadership. With this, we will not only cope in times of crisis, we will lead. <laughs>